My name is Amanda, and I am um, Pastor Blake. I am his wife. If, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, I hope to do that later. And I, I'm always thankful for the lead worshipers, aren't you guys? But I just want to say, if you guys don't know, we are so thankful for Joel and his family. They are here, and they are a part now of the Radius staff. And so we thank you, Joel, for leading. And I know that is a song that has ministered to me so much, and I'm so glad you introduced it here at Radius, um, that king of my heart. So we're starting a new series today, and it's called Origins. And I, I think it's such a cool thought personally because, you know, there was a 70-mile journey that Mary and Joseph walked from Nazareth to Bethlehem, riding on a donkey, you know, all the pictures that we kind of associate with Christmas, and that's quite a journey. But that is not the only journey that led us to the Messiah's birth. There are hundreds of other couples and people that are found in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And all those stories were chosen and woven together. And it's not an accident who God placed that line in. And so even though it's a kind of a curvy journey, that, that, that line of who God used to bring the Messiah, it's an interesting one. And it's, empo- it's a powerful one because it tells us who God is, his character, by who he chose to use. You know what I'm saying? So today in Origins, we're going to start off with the character Leah. And so we're going to find ourselves in Genesis chapter 29. And the cool thing about this story for me, I, I find it really funny because I grew up in church. And I was in church like if the doors were open, you know, one of those stories. And back then, see, kids don't know what church is now. Back then, I mean, we went to Sunday school, we went to main church, then we went to Sunday night, and then we had Wednesday night. And if it was summer, we were attending with our mom when she went to visitation. Because she would go knock, knock, knock on the doors and say, thank you for coming this past Sunday. I mean, we were at the church, okay? And so, and it worked, I guess, because I'm still at the church. Um, But what's funny about kids in church is that... They just say what they think. And so there's sometimes when rag kids, you know, and you'll say a verse or you'll try to get them to memorize a verse. And they're like, I don't like that verse, you know. And I'm like, yeah, I don't like that verse either. But we don't get to pick and choose what's in the scripture, you know what I mean? But there's stories that kids will just be like, I don't really like that story, you know. And I don't really like this story. This story was when I was a kid, I did not like this story. I kind of didn't like the characters in the story. I just didn't want anything to do with them. And when they brought out the flannel graph that I've talked about before, I didn't like this one. I was like, I don't like that flannel graph. That's not a cool one. But as an adult, it shifted. And now I can't even read this story without feeling the weight of inspiration and how God just has breathed into it. So I hope you enjoy it today as we talk about the character Leah. You guys say Leah? Leah, awesome. Let's jump into Genesis 29. I'll get there. Fear not. Oh, it's even dog-eared. I should have got there faster. Okay, Genesis 29. We're going to start right at verse 1. And as Leah's story starts, it starts with a man, like a lot of women's stories do. So let's jump right in. (laughs) Then Jacob continued on his journey. And came to the land of the eastern peoples. Funny thing is, Jacob's in look for a wife, and he's looking within his family for a wife. So he's kind of visiting extended family. There he saw a well in the field with three flocks of sheep lying near it because the flocks were watered from that well. Now, there are no accidents in Scripture, so I want you to pay attention to this part because I find this part funny. This is, to me, is like a God joke, okay? So you got you to pay attention to catch the God jokes, okay? So <laughs> pay attention. Here we go. The stone over the mouth of the well was, read it with me, large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they waited till everybody was there because it was a big old rock they had to move. The shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth and water the sheep. Then they would return the stone to its place over the mouth of the well. What they're trying to say is they're going to do this once. (laughs) It's a big old stone. They're moving it once. Jacob asked the shepherds, my brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they replied. He said to them, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? That's the relative he's going to be visiting. Yes, we know him, they answered. 
And then Jacob asked them, is he well? Yes, he is, they said. And here, play some dramatic music in your mind, comes his daughter Rachel with the sheep. Look, he said, the sun is still high. Is it not time for the flocks to be gathered? Water the sheep and take them back to pasture. We can't, they replied, until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still talking with them, Rachel, dramatic music, came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and Laban's sheep, he went over. Are you ready? And rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. It's like the reason all those little details are in there, because this writer wants you to know, when he saw Rachel, he was like, oh, I'll roll this stone away. <laughs> right? He's impressed with Rachel. And I got proof. We're going to keep reading, okay? <laughs> then, after, okay, he watered his uncle's sheep. Then, you ready? Jacob kissed Rachel. Read it. And began to weep aloud. That's a, that's a legit kiss. That is. <laughs> I've been kissed a lot, but I've never been kissed where I wept, okay? So Jacob was like, oh, this woman is so beautiful. She is everything I have wanted in a woman. And I will now weep after I kiss her. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of his, her father and a son of Rebekah, so she ran and told her father. So basically, Jacob has found his relatives, and he has seen this woman, and he has rolled stones away for this woman, and he has kissed this woman, and he is impressed with this woman. In fact, if we go down to verse 16, verse 16, we're about to read in there, and now... It says, uh, now Laban, that one, now Laban. Before we jump in there, wait, 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 look up here. I told you this was Leah's story. We haven't met Leah yet. We've met Jacob, rolling stone away. We've met Rachel. She's so beautiful that she makes men cry when they kiss her. <gasps> Where's Leah? It is Leah's story. It is. We've got to keep reading. Now Laban had, told, had two daughters. The name of the older was? Leah. Here she is. And the name of the younger was Rachel. Oh, the older sister to the beauty. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Let me tell you, this is in Hebrew, okay? Let me tell you, I'm going to bottom line this for you. This phrase, weak eyes, does not appear anywhere else in Hebrew, Okay? So a lot of interpreters are like, what does this mean? What does this mean? Best case scenario, best case scenario, this means they were light colored and so they were pretty eyes. So best case scenario, it says, Leah had nice eyes. Rachel, oh, beautiful, great body. She was all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> Literally in scripture, recorded for eternity. <laughs> That's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, Leah's got messed up eyes. So it's like, but Rachel was great forever in scripture. So today, as we go into Leah's story, I don't know if you notice, I have lemons up here. Leah's been handed some lemons in life. She's the older sister of the beauty queen, and she's got weak eyes. It's tough, right? If you came here today and you're like, man, I just, I'm Charlie Brown Christmas. I am Charlie Brown. And you know, nothing seems to go right. Nothing seems to be right. Every situation seems to be rough and hard and troubling. This is the message for you. Leah has been handed a lemon in her life. And that's not the only one she's going to get. We're going to keep reading. Jacob, verse 18, was in love with Rachel. Yeah, no kidding, right? And said to Laban, I will work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Seven years. That's a long time. That's a big deal. She, he is really in love. Laban said, it's better. I love Laban because he's like a loser. He's like, ah, well, it's better that I give her to you than some other man. So, yeah, stay here and work with me, you know. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. 
You ready? Cue the music. But they seemed like only a few days for him because of his love for her. Yes, it's true. So we're going to stop for a second, and I'm going to jump out of scriptures. I'm going to kind of explain what happens. He works for seven years for Laban, working for the sheep, doing all that. Comes in in the seven years, you can imagine. I don't know how many crying kisses he snuck, but he is ready to marry Rachel, right? And so he's like, Laban, give me Rachel to wife. So they begin the process of the festival and the feast and all that for the wedding. And that night, Laban has a plan. How am I going to unload the older one with the weak guys? How am I going to unload her? I know. I'll sneak her in. Jacob will think it's Rachel. Problem solved. I'm done with Leah. I mean, I can unload Rachel. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I got to get rid of Leah, right? So Laban devises his plan. And Leah, see, some lemons we get are not handed to us. Some of them we choose. And Leah says, okay, that's a great plan. Let's do that, Dad. Not a good plan. So Jacob, and let's be real. This is the funny part, too. This story is just full of humor. The funny part is the next morning, Jacob wakes up and goes, what? <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't my dream, girl. And realizes he's been duped. And he comes to Laban, you can imagine, upset. And Laban's like, okay, well, just give Leah a week for a honeymoon. And then I'll give you Rachel too. But you got to work another seven years. And Jacob's like, she's totally worth it. I will work another seven years. So Leah spends the rest of the week of her honeymoon while Jacob plans that he's going to get Rachel. What about that lemon? How's that feel? It's a good one, right? So if you have been handed some situations this week where you feel unnoticed and unwanted, guess what? Leah, too. She's been there. So let's jump into scriptures and see. We're going to keep reading. Jacob agreed to that. And we're going to jump into verse 30. It says, Jacob... Lay with Rachel also, but this is the key part. And he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. I mean, 14 years. I mean, it's like 14 years he worked for Rachel. He didn't work any of those years for Leah. Zero. It was a BOGO. He got one because he was working for the other one. Okay? When Whatever the situation is in your life right now, whatever lemons you're holding on to, here's where God inserts himself into the story. And this is important. We're headed toward Christmas time when Jesus is inserted into the world and everything shifts. And that is what happens every time God is inserted into a story. The ripple effects of that, it changes things. And here we see God. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved. See, there's a story earlier in Genesis of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. It's another tragic story. And God comes and talks to Hagar. And in that space, Hagar, who had never had a relationship with God, says, I know who you are. You're the God who sees me. And that's exactly what we see here. The Lord sees Leah. And it's powerful. You might be unnoticed in your life. But I can tell you, the Lord has seen you. He knows exactly where you are. He knows all those feelings that you have. He knows that you've been unloved. See, what's interesting to me about that phrase is because there's been plenty of times I have felt unloved. There have. Wah, what was me? This is an eternal scripture. The Lord saw that Leah was not loved. Leah was actually not loved. It wasn't a feeling. It was a truth. That's powerful, you guys. But the Lord's about to, he's about to shift things. We got to pay attention. We got to see what's going on. 
So he opened, you see this? When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. Keep reading. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said, okay, here's where it gets good. For she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. So she gave God some glory. You're in this. You've seen me, God. You see what I am having to deal with. You see this trouble in my life. You see the hurt, the heartbreak, this feeling. You see me in this space. And then she says, surely my husband will love me now. She had her focus here, but I need this situation fixed. I need it my way. I need this man to love me. Focus back to people. I do that, right? God, help me. Now I got to take care of it. (laughs) God, help me. My focus is really these people and this situation and how I need to make this work. And I want what I want out of this situation. And why can't I get what I want? And so that's where Leah finds herself. How about you? How are you doing this week? You had some lemons handed to you? You say, well, I talked to God about it. Yeah. Where's your focus? Because Leah's focus, God is in my misery. Yay, God. But I got to deal with this situation. My focus is still there. Let's keep reading. Verse 33, she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, second son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. Okay. She's like, God loves me because I've heard that that he's heard that I'm not loved. He gave me another son. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, ready? Ready? This one, to me, this is like when you study plays and you study theater, there's always one line that is the character's motivation. It is the line that tells you about this character. Here it is for her. Now, at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Do you hear it? Hear that heartbreak? You hear the pleading, this time, maybe this time, that striving. If I can just, if I could just get this, if I could just get this, this situation will work out. If I could just have it my way, then, then everything would work out and I would be happy. Maybe this time. Who attached to me? Man, guys, that's heavy. We are literally looking into the heart of this woman. I've been there, man. There's been times, you know, I was telling first hour, I talk a lot about, you know, I lost my parents like a year and a half ago, both of them within a year. That was a really, that's a grieving. But I tell you, I have grieved dreams even harder than that. I really have. There were some things that just seemed to speak over you. You're not enough. What do you think Leah heard right in that moment? You're not enough. You've given him three sons. Maybe this time he will become attached to me. You're not enough. You guys. But remember, it's shifting because God inserted himself here. And he is working and he is talking to Leah. She's hearing him, not fully, but she's hearing him. She's trying. She's moving forward. Verse 35. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, everybody reading it, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. And she named him Judah. You see, and sometimes I like to think of myself, I'm not very smart, but every once in a while I like to like dabble in Hebrew and make myself feel good about myself. And so I looked this phrase up. This time I will praise the Lord. That word praise, it's the first time. The word praise is mentioned in the scriptures from the chronological that we have right here in Genesis. It's the first time the word praise is mentioned. First time. There's several words for praise in Hebrew. This specific one is yada. 
I'm not saying it right because I don't know Hebrew. I already told you that. So don't ask me to say it right. But it's something like that. Yada, okay? Judah. Yada. You hear it? That's why she's naming him. This time I will praise the Lord. See, in Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew is actually a picture language. Pictograph language, like Egypt. We, we know Egypt, right? On the tombs, we think of the hieroglyphs that are written there. Well, ancient Hebrew is also a picture language. And the picture for Yada is actually hands throwing. You see, Leah had been handed some lemons. And when it came time and she had Judas, she finally said, this time I will Praise the Lord. Because some praise looks all happy and cheerful. But you know what? Some praise is desperation and is on your knees and it is throwing those situations that you can't deal with, you can't work out, and it is on your knees saying, Yada, this time I will praise the Lord. My praise is me throwing it to God because I might have limits. But Romans 8.28 says, For I know that all things work together for good for them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Guess what? I know the lemonade maker. And so I can choose this time to praise the Lord. I can take those lemons and I can actively throw them to the lemonade maker. And see, he's really good at something. He's going to take those lemons. He's going to mix it with some other stuff, and he's going to make lemonade. And that's refreshing. I love lemonade. It's refreshing. The thing with this story is, Leah said, Yada, Judah. She had no idea what ripple effect she just set out into motion. Because God said, oh, I can use that. I can use that. And he took Judah, and he said, this will be the messianic line. This is where Jesus, this is where the promised one is going to come. Yada. This bad situation is going get to get to be a blessing to everybody. Guess what? You are blessed here today because Leah said, this time I will praise the Lord. Because God can use Your lemons, when you give them up, you're going to hold on to them. You're going to get bitter. You're going to give them up. He says, oh, great. I got something to work with. You got to throw them up to him. And it's it's not the pretty things, you know, like, oh, look at all the good. Look at how good I'm parenting today. I'm going to throw that up to you. (laughs) That's not what God's interested in. He wants our lemons. Because, you know, lemonade's refreshing, but it starts in a bitter space. That's how he refreshes the nations, through Leah's bitter space, he brought Jesus. In fact, have you ever sung a song, the Lion of Judah? Jesus Christ is called the Lion of Judah because the king's line in Israel comes through Judah. And the king's line, David, not Saul, but David, the true king's line, when it comes through The lion becomes the theme of that kingship. And so when we say lion of Judah, we're declaring Jesus to be the rightful king of Israel, the rightful king of our lives, the lion of Judah. That happened because Leah threw some lemons up. Isn't that good? Okay, so let's back it up. Let's look at our lives, okay? We need to do that. This week... I have actually talked to multiples of you who've had lemons come into your life this week. Some of you have lemons that you still hold on to. You don't know what to do with them. From when you were five and six and somebody said, you're not wanted. You're not loved. Or your life, you just started noticing that you weren't noticed. (laughs) You started noticing nobody really cares. Man, you think it's an accident God puts Leah in Jesus' line? You think that's an accident? You think he is saying instead to you, I notice, yeah, I see it. I see 
when and where you're not loved. This time, what are you going to do with it? Because every day you get a chance to do something with it. I've had things come into my life, and I'm telling you, I've done it the wrong way, just like Leah. <laughs> she had three other kids, you know? She had three other kids. She was like, Ma, but, uh. but this time she chose. You know, every time we're handed a lemon, we get a choice. We're going to throw it out. And here's the thing with me. I'm going to assume it's with you too. Sometimes i got to keep throwing that lemon up. It comes back down. It comes back down. i got to toss it back up. But if I hold on to it, you want to know where I get negative and complaining? I haven't been throwing up those lemons. Lemons are going to come. This week they're coming. You're going to have a bushel at the end of the week. What are you going to do with those? You're going to hold on to those? Is that what you want to do? See, Leah never even saw that her line was the king's line. Leah never even saw that Jesus Christ was going to be born from her. She never saw that. She just threw up some lemons. But God, man, I love this. God knew. God said, I can use what man rejects. What did I write here? Selects. God selects what man rejects. Jacob didn't, Jacob didn't pick Leah. God picked Leah. Isn't that good? Because in that space, she threw him up. Isn't that good? Let's take a second and pray. Let's have you.